Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to some of you. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone across the globe to Motors Academy in all of our webinar events. My name is Jackson, and with me here today, I have Sarah, and we will be your host for today's session, Upper Limb Robotics, a Clinician's Perspective. Hi, everybody, Sarah here. Welcome to our second webinar of this series. I'm very excited to host with Jackson as we hear from different professionals in various parts of the world on their experience with upper limb robotics. Without further delay, let's welcome our speakers. Joining us on our panel today, we have Jose Lopez, the founder and also a clinical director at European Neuroscience Center. He is an expert in neurology, rehab rehabilitation, robotics, and advanced technologies in rehabilitation at Cotec, which is the Council of Occupational Therapies for the European countries. He is also an independent member of ISAT, which is the International Industry Society in Advanced Rehabilitation Technology, and an expert consultant and instructor at Hokoma. So next, we have Amy dennis Jones. Hi, Amy. Amy is a specialist physiotherapist and has been working in the field for 18 years. So she started working with Hobbs Rehabilitation in 2004 and is now based in their Intensive Neurotechnology Centre. So with a keen interest in technology and research, Amy is also involved in the launch of their MINT concept, which I believe she will share with us today. And she will also be presenting at Rehab Week in Rotterdam in July this year. And last but not least, we have Nick Flynn. He is a lecturer in the discipline of occupational therapy at the Australian Catholic University in Brisbane, as well as continuing to work clinically in the rehab rehabilitation unit at the Mater Private Rehabilitation Hospital. He has over 19 years of clinical experience specializing in the adult's physical rehabilitation and is currently completing his PhD which he will share with us today. He is also running projects in the exploration of the clinical use of non-immersive virtual technology and the interactive touchscreen platforms in the rehabilitation settings. Now that we have a good idea of all our speakers here, let's, let us get started. So we also welcome questions from the audience. So please do type them in the Q&A box below and we'll try our best to keep an eye on them and get our speakers to answer them live as well. So first let's welcome Jose Lopez, the founder and clinical director at CN in Spain. So good morning to all, good afternoon, good evening. And thanks for the invitation. It is a real pleasure to be here. I am going to share a presentation that I did today. So, okay. So, if you want to, to be in, in contact with me, you can. I have a, a LinkedIn profile, so you can you can reach me through LinkedIn, and you can also take a look at my experience and and education if you want. Today, I'm going to talk briefly about the past, uh, the present, and the future of um, robotics in rehabilitation, especially dedicated to the upper limb. Because, as you know, we need to learn from the past and things that have been done. Uh, we need to continue offering in the present the best uh, possible treatments for our patients. And we, we need to believe that the future is going to be even better than, than the present. So we need to, to innovate and we need to think about how can we improve the things we are doing. So talking about the past, I recommend you, I also gave all these references to the organizers, so they are going to share it with you. Uh, I recommend you to visit ISART's uh, website where you can find this educational material, these presentations, and there is one presentation about history of new technologies in rehabilitation. And here you can see the beginning of robotic rehabilitation and the beginning of rehabilitation. So the first robot in the market was the Emotion, the MIT Manus robot that I had the opportunity to work with 
in back in 2005 here in Madrid in one um, clinic. Um, as you can see in rehabilitation, the movement therapy started like in 1920s and they were at that time already using some um, prototypes, some uh, very early devices to do some weight support for the upper limbs. So what we see now in the present, there are some robotic um, devices that they do this weight support um, for the upper limbs, but they are based on these um, old devices that were used a lot of time um, back in the past. So um, in this presentation uh, that you can find on ISART's website, you're gonna see the evolution of these devices. This is a very um, recent field of work so we still need to continue developing and, and working on, on this because it's been only like 30 years from the first um, robotic device. Then um, robotics is not the only advanced technologies that we can find in rehabilitation and, and the classification is, well, you have some robot assisted uh, therapy, but then you have also non-actuator devices. You have functional electrical stimulation, sensor technology, virtual reality devices, and, and, and brain stimulation. So you can find the evolution of all these different uh, technologies in that presentation. And the most important thing for me is the human robot interaction. So um, in my opinion, the all these uh, technologies um, have improved because they have improved this human robot interaction and this is going to be also the way of improving the devices in the future. Then in the present we have a lot of references you also have them um, in the chat box uh, where we can um, find out the uh, scientific evidence for the different treatments in um, mainly in stroke rehabilitation, but also in other neurological um, injuries like traumatic brain injury or um, um, tumors, multiple sclerosis, but it's mainly about stroke, right? So what we can see in all these different guidelines and, and systematic reviews is that there are some recommendations and the confusing part of this is that in some guidelines you can see that robotic therapy is recommended for in this case for example for moderate severe paresis but in other um, guidelines they are not recommended right so it's a little bit confusing nowadays people working in the clinical practice we in um, we shouldn't forget that evidence-based practice is not only the best research evidence available, but also we need to use our clinical expertise and we need to take into account our patients' values. So then at the end to decide what is the best treatment that we can provide to our patients. And then also we need to take into account all the information that we now have available from um, these um, algorithms and the um, prognosis for the upper limb recovery. So in the future, I have some ideas that I would like to share with you how to improve um, um, the use of robotics in rehabilitation and also how to improve rehabilitation uh, in general of the upper limb, because we know that um, Rehabilitation of the upper limb is much more complex than rehabilitation of their lower limb or walking. So um, I have had many patients that they were told by um, different professionals, okay, maybe you can walk again, but mm, forget about your arm. So we need to think about how to improve that prognosis, right? Uh, one important aspect is the biomarkers, how we collect information from um, different um, scales, from different uh, tests to know how to know better how the patient is going to, to improve. And now we have more information about um, the importance of the cortical spinal tract, um, how if we test the motor evoked potentials 
of uh, this cortical spinal tract and we see that there is some integrity of this um, tract, then the, um, pro uh, the, evolu the progression of the treatment is gonna be better. We know that also different assessments give us very good information. So we need to, to use this information. This is of, co of course more important and relevant in the acute or subacute phase. Then if we have a patient in the chronic phase, this is gonna be much more complex to use. Then we need also to analyze the uh, functional upper limb uh, motion, mobility, um, based on the complexity that this, uh, the upper limb has. So um, one important difference between the upper limb and the lower limb or walking and the functional use of the upper limb is the complexity. So we know that the lower limb moves in a cyclic way and the, the walking pattern is more or less always the same, but the upper limb has a very um, 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 high complexity and um, so there is no cyclic movements. But then we need to analyze all these movements um, based on this complexity to um, really analyze the things that we are doing in the in rehabilitation, if they are, you know, focusing on the different aspects that the patient has, um, and that in the patient is not working well, and we need to to improve it. So we need to stop using these easy ways of analyzing the movements in the arm just by moving one joint, and think about that the main problem in a, a brain injury patient is the capacity to coordinate all different joints in the arm at the same time into a functional task. Then we need also to stop using things in rehabilitation that has been, you know, the things that we have been doing for a long time, but has been already proved that they don't work. So we know that there is a huge gap between the things that uh, normally that um, we get from research and then the clinical application of those things. But we are still using a lot of things based on all the school rehabilitation that they don't work. And we need to stop doing that. Otherwise, we are not going to get better results. So then you have here a few examples of that that you can, you can read on the paper because you have the references already on the chat. And here, um, some ideas that I think is gonna be the future of rehabilitation for the upper limb. And of course, robotics, they can also have uh, a big influence on all these aspects. The first one is tele-rehabilitation. We know that um, our patients, they could start doing more rehabilitation at home as a complement of what they do in the clinic or uh, as something that they can continue doing once they have finished the therapy in the clinic. And there are um, some robotic devices that you can bring to the patient's homes and they can continue practicing there. Then we know that if our artificial intelligence is gonna be something um, very good in the future because we can uh, collect more information, we can have large uh, databases and we can uh, learn from this artificial intelligence how to um, use the best approaches for rehabilitation for each patient. Then we have also the neuromodulation, which is applied by known invasive um, brain stimulation devices or um, also medications. I think we need to focus on recovery and not compensation. And of course, this is not applied for all patients in all um, circumstances, but in many patients, especially at the beginning in the acute or subacute phase, they start being treated in a compensative way. And I think that at that moment, we need to um, start uh, treating them, focusing on, on recovery and, and focusing on um, gaining again, like the more 
normal as possible um, motor control, strength, etc. Then we need also to engage other controlational cortical spinal pathways that we can do that. And there are some interesting papers about brain computer interface, some kinds of bilateral training, uh, mirror feedback and action observation. Then we need to, to improve patients and, and empowerment. And this is also related to, uh, for example, tele-rehabilitation. Uh, but in the past, patients, they were going to rehabilitation, then they were more passive, like, okay, do whatever you want with me and you're going to, to heal me. And I'm just here a passive um, guy, right? So now we need to, to change that because that's also going to change uh, patients' um, uh, scores and, and improvements. We need to create enriched environments. So um, also maybe one problem of rehabilitation is that some places they don't have many opportunities for the patient to practice in different situations with different devices, with different activities. So we need to create these enriched environments to stimulate uh, neuroplasticity. Again, engagement, motivation, confidence, autonomy, and social relatedness is very important in rehabilitation. And we need to take that into account. And we need to forget about one size to fit all. It's not about, okay, we have one robotic device and we are gonna put all the patients in that robotic device, or we are going to make like um, um, a circuit where all patients, they go, um, they work with the same devices, but we need to analyze that and we need to see based on what I am uh, told before about analyzing um, the complexity of the functional uh, upper limb movement and what the patient is lacking, analyzing that to give the patient the best device or the best treatment that they need. So uh, finally, we need to always um, take into account that we are what we repeatedly do and excellence is not an act, but a habit. So it's not, okay, I'm going to work on this device for a week and then, you know, all the problems are going to be solved. But we need to, to think about rehabilitation of the upper limb as um, the patient's habit to continue using the upper limb as much as possible during uh, the 24 hours that the day has. So thank you very much. And I'll be glad to answer your questions at the end of this uh, session. Thank you, Jose, for your interesting sharing. So I definitely agree that human-robot interaction is key for the implementation of advanced rehabilitation. I believe now uh, most companies also involve like a collaborative between like engineers, clinicians, and researchers into them producing, as you've mentioned, um, not a device that fits one size for all, but also to be more inclusive into the different um, presentation that the patients can have. Next, let's welcome our next speaker, Amy, from Hobbs Rehabilitation to share her presentation. Can everyone see that okay? Yep. Perfect. Um, thank you very much for the invite to talk today at your webinar. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we do and who we are at Hobbs Rehabilitation in the UK. Um, brief bit of introduction about who I am and what I do, um, and then also discuss a little bit about our mint concept that we are also launching this year, which um, actually complements the work that Fourier are doing here with the Motus Academy as well. Um, and I'm going to finish off talking a bit about a patient case, load, a case study that we've um, been treating in our neurotechnology centre and the upper limb technology that we used with him for his treatment. So, so Hobbs Rehabilitation, we're an um, independent provider of interdisciplinary neuro rehab in the south of the UK. And we have about 11 different centres dotted around the south of the UK. Um, and we 
pride ourselves on our clinical excellence and clinical reasoning as clinicians um, with hands on treatment, um, but obviously recognize the intensity and dosage is quite key in neuroplasticity and rehabilitation as the evidence is emerging from that. Um, our centres vary from either residential intensive services to outpatient services to domiciliary services. Um, and we have varying different specialists within our therapists. So what do we do? We provide services for the National Health Service in the UK. We also have um, lots of patients are funded from independent sectors and health um, insurance, as well as people that individually fund. We are getting a few more people that are starting to also fundraise for their treatment and their rehab packages. Um, but our work isn't entirely clinical. So um, with the launch of the Mint concept this year, we have always been working and alongside lots of universities with student placements, but getting a bit more involved with research and development of neurotechnology devices. Um, and we're currently involved in an EU reg um, project between France and the UK in building um, an upper limb robot. Um, so we've been engaging in technology for a number of years, whether it's really simple, basic stuff from FES, going all the way forward to some of the stuff that you're seeing on the screen here. Um, so just a little bit about our MINT concept. So the MINT concept was developed in that we recognised that there was a, a gap between clinicians being confident with using new and emerging devices with their patients. Um, and a lot of technology was kind of being put in the cupboard, not being used. And um, we recognise the need to kind of provide a framework of education to empower the clinicians to be able to use these devices and embed them into their practice. Um, because we, we recognise with the research that's coming out that actually it's very much needed in terms of increasing dosage and handling um, for the patients to get the most out of their recovery. So the Minton concept was conceived 2018, I think we had our first kind of mini Mint conference where we just introduced lots of clinicians to a lot of different technologies. Um, but since then the concept has evolved and we will be launching our official website this year. So watch this space. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, so before I slide into this, I. I've been working for Hobbs, as Sarah said in the introduction, since 2004, um, 14, and I've moved around a different a couple of different centres, and I'm now based in our intensive neurotechnology centre here in Bristol in the UK. So it's our first neurotechnology intensive centre that we have within Hobbs, and we are looking to develop and hopefully build another centre soon. Um, so we Basically, the evidence is emerging that neuroplasticity is what we utilize for recovery um, after any neurological insult. Um, and the evidence is emerging that we need to be specific, give the intensity and the dosage and the repetition that for patients to engage, but it has to be repetition that's engaging rather than mundane and boring, because all of that creates behavioral changes, which helps to build on that neuroplastic change. We've heard about, you know, use it or lose it and use it and improve it. So all very key points in um, neuro recovery. And we know from audits that have happened in the UK, our SNAP audit, which is a national stroke audit, that as therapists alone in a stroke service, we do not and we can't give enough intensity in our conventional treatment. Um, so this is where neurotechnology comes in to help us to give that intensity. So this is just a bit of an example of some of the upper limb technology that we have within Hobbs. So we have a big range of different types of technology. Um, here in Bristol, where I'm based, we are quite tyro motion heavy, um, but we do have other technologies within um, our other centres. So we've got um, a Fourier M2 robot based in one of our residential services. Um, we've recently started working with the Maya Pro, which you can see on the screen on the far right, um, as well as more home-based equipment like the gripper ball and the neuro ball, as well as your good old fashioned, really simple technology such as FES, which 
I think um, can't be underrated. So a little bit about our patient. So this is Mark. He is, um, I think he's now 48. So he had a stroke about six years ago, so about 42. And um, it was really unclear how he had his stroke. It was possibility that it was a hemorrhagic stroke. He was he needed a craniectomy at the time to relieve the pressure. Um, but yeah, so there was no kind of obvious cardiac or vas vascular issues noted. He was a previous. He was pr prior to that. He was a marine, so he was really fit, really healthy, really physically active, and was keen into his outdoor pursuits, kind of swimming, paddleboarding, surfing, cycling, walking, all of that kind of stuff, which does have a bit of an input into his rehab package. So he had his acute NHS um, input following his stroke. And then he had about, I think about a year's worth of rehabilitation through Headley Court, which is the military rehab um, services in the UK. So, um, oh, there we go. So I'm gonna talk mostly about his upper limb impairments because of the topic of today, but he had obviously whole body impairments. He had lower limb and core and upper limb impairments. Um, and a lot of his lower limb and trunk impairments fed into his upper limb impairments. So um, initially he has, his biggest issue in his upper limb is spasticity. So he had a lot of flexor tone, a lot of increased tone in his biceps, lots of co-contraction with any activation um, really poor scapular shoulder blade stability and activation, um, weaker around his core and his trunk on that side and weakness generally throughout his upper limb. So even before we had met Mark in our intensive service in Bristol, he'd already had tendon transfers and tendon releases into his wrist and hand because of um, muscle tight, short, tish, short tissue tightness and spasticity through that upper limb. Um, his goals, like I said, he's a keen outdoor pursuits man. His goals was to look at improving his forward reach for when he was paddleboarding, kayaking and rowing. So that reach forward to be able to pull back uh, and, and bilaterally. Um, he is planning to swim the channel next year in a relay team of five. So he wanted to really work on improving his swimming technique. He already swims, open water swims anyway but look at improving the technique with that upper limb and also um, look at improving his gait generally, but also his arm swing during gait. So he had two packages with us in Bristol. Um, I'll just play a little video. So this is a little video of, of him just trying to move his arm. And you can see instantly he has that compensation um, strategy of shoulder abduction shoulder elevation and that having to um to elicit kind of shoulder elbow flexion and extension so he's got very restrictive and very weak triceps in terms of being able to actively extend his arm away and you can see that yeah that compensation coming in and as he tries to extend his arm away he gets a big co-contraction in his bicep muscle and he's, he does have, so this is his upper limb as well, he does have a little bit of movement isolated into his hand. But again, lots of co-contraction, elbow flexion, which you can't see because the therapist is holding his hand down. Um, but to able to find that activity, there's an awful lot of co-contraction that's happening in further up the chain in his upper limb. So what we did, um, he actually had... So he had two packages here with us in Bristol. I'll just jump back to the next slide, uh, the previous slide. He had two packages with us in Bristol. And the first package, because he had so much tone and spasticity in his upper limb, was about improving his lower limb efficiency. So his gait fed into his upper limb tone. So with the effort he was using for his gait and his running, his tone was increasing in that arm. So until we actually address some of those inefficiencies in his lower down the chain we couldn't impact on the um, spasticity that we were seeing in the upper limb so the first package was mm, a lot to do with that 
And then he went away, got on with life, did more challenges. I think he cycled Land's End to John O'Groats, which is a big old cycle challenge in the UK, did all sorts of fundraising for his charity. Um, and then he went to have an assessment for the Maya Pro in um, our Winchester Centre back in January 2021, I believe. Um, so this was with the thought to use the Maya Pro to prepare his upper limb ready for another intensive package with us in Bristol um, in our intensive service. So the Maya Pro, if you are some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. It's an EMG triggered device that uses motors at the elbow and the wrist, um, sorry, at the hand to facilitate elbow flexion, extension and hand opening, closing. It's got like a three chuck movement at the hand. And because of the EMG, it's used to help people to lots of feedback into what their tone is actually doing to see if they can work on modifying their tone and reducing the co-contractions. Um, and boost booster their EMG signals. So, and then the motors will then assist with the selectivity of that movement. So um, I would play these. I'll just loop them around. So the first um, video you can see here, this is a, um, a video of the EMG activation that you can see. So visually the patient can have a look at the screen. So what we're trying to do here, you can see there are two lines, one's higher than the other, is we're looking at specific movements into flexion and extension of his elbow. And what you want to see is two distinct lines, one higher as you're increasing the EMG activity in one muscle group and then reducing the um, agonist, antagonist EMG activity. And you can work on sustaining. So you can see here, he's trying to sustain right at the end. You can see lots of little peaks. He's trying to sustain his tricep activity whilst reducing his bicep activity towards the end. So um, you'll see that in a minute in the next, as it comes up, um, I think it's about here. So that's his triceps and trying to reduce his bicep activity. And then here, so here we're trying to get him to sustain his tricep activity, the top line, but while trying to also reduce his bicep activity. And here is the device in action. So there are varying modes with this device. You can set it to automatically flex the upper limb so they can work on increasing their um, extensor activation. And then you can reverse that. And then you can put that in combination um, to try and get them to work on being able to switch that reciprocal um, EMG activation. Okay, hopefully I can move on to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so other things that we did. Um, so he did he did the MyoPro assessment and then he did he had a block of treatment to work on the MyoPro um, at our Winchester Centre and he was able to increase his repetitions of elbow flexion extension from 109 initially with the device on to 278. So we know that there was an increase in muscle um, stamina. And then his active elbow extension at the end of the package with the Maya Pro increased from 15 degrees active elbow extension to 60. So he was making some gains through that device. And then he came to us um, in Bristol in our neurotechnology center. And we did another program with a focus on upper limb and um, working towards the goals we mentioned earlier. So we looked at combining different technologies. And obviously, like I mentioned, we're a little bit tyro heavy where we are currently, but um, hoping to expand on that a little bit. Um, so we looked at combining the use of functional electrical stimulation to help improve his muscle selectivity and strength while using some other upper limb devices. And we looked at changing postures, modifying um, positions to kind of maximize towards his goals. We've obviously got the element of feedback from the gaming element, which helps to improve the motivation and work specifically on those movement patterns that we're after. And because we've got the sensor-based technology, it just allows us to really target the specific movements that we're trying to improve for Mark, so swimming. Um, so this is just a couple of different slides and arm swing was the other one. I haven't got a video of us practicing his arm swing, but 
here's a little video of him. So this is using, so I'm really trying to, trying to loop that, but it's not wanting to do it anyway. So this is us, um, this is him with just the FES on initially. I'm just gonna pause that one. And he's just working on his upper limb reach. And then we incorporated the sensor here with Pablo and you can just about see on the screen as he brings brings his arm forward for a reach gives uh, so selective elbow extension he will move the elevator up or down there we go i'm trying to loop it so we place the fes around his shoulder around his glenohumeral joint to give him some stability proximally and then we also put, put another channel into his triceps to help increases muscle strength to work on forward reach. We also did the same setup working on arm swing in standing and then we incorporated that into the device and then the next video we continue to use um, the FES you can't see it because he's got his shirt back on um, but also giving him some stability and then we worked in side lying to work on that forward reach that you need for a front crawl swimming stroke and we pop that specific movement pattern again into um, a game to try and work on improving that. And the last one we had a little look at was we, he really didn't like this one. So, so there's no sound because he's putting a lot of effort in. So here we also worked on that pull, that backward stroke you have, the pull down for your swimming element and we use the FES again here but we used it around his the back of his shoulder blade to help with shoulder retraction and into his triceps to maintain that extension and again we used a Pablo sensor around his wrist to feed that into a game as well and I'm just aware of the time so just to sum up really quickly and we obviously did lots of outcome measures um, with him during his package just to really sum up um so i think from therapist point of view clinical reasoning is vital to allow you to know your device as well to be able to think about which is the right device to use for that patient but also for that specific activity that you're trying to focus on and then being able to be confident with the device and the, and your clinical reasoning to be able to adapt modify maybe combine different technologies and to get the results that you're after and there's still a massive need for the therapists for our skills to be able to find the right level of challenge the right level of repetition but also sometimes with the devices we'll talk about I think a bit later the limitations with some of these devices is you still need to provide some hands-on facilitation and assistance to get those better movement patterns that we're after but we do know that newer technology is here to stay and that it really helps to build that intensity and the repetition that patients need to get the neuroplastic change for recovery. Thank you very much. And here's where you can find us all, um, all our social medias, maybe take a screenshot if you'd like and question towards the end, I think. Thank you, Amy. For the interesting case studies and treatment plans of the use of upper limb robotic devices, I'm sure the audiences are really amazed at the use of robotics, such as like the FES, the tyro motion, uh, and the ones that you showed in the clinical settings and cannot wait to visit Bristol, right? Yes, yeah. thanks, Amy. No I, think, I think you guys are very creative into combining your devices and also then changing the different um, ways into using it, using that really as an adjunct and as a tool. Right, so last but certainly not least, let's welcome Nick Flynn from Brisbane to share his perspective on upper limb robotics. Thanks, Sarah. And um, thanks, Jose and Amy, they're great. And uh, I'll just share my slides to begin with. So we can all see that and you can all hear me. Yep, good. All right, I'll get started. Okay, so yeah, thank you for inviting me, um, Modus Academy, this evening. 
Um, yeah, I'm in Australia and uh, yeah, I'm a lecturer in occupational therapy and I'm an ongoing clinician in one of the private rehabilitation units here in Brisbane as well. And I'm doing my PhD specifically looking at the implementation of uplim robotics uh, for subacute stroke survivors in routine clinical practice. So I'm going to talk to one of the studies that make up my PhD in particular as a bit of a case study, really, and a bit of a grassroots sort of look at what a therapist think about uh, robotics as it comes into play for them for the first time clinically. So the title of this study, which has just been submitted to Disability and Rehabilitation, is Implementing Robotic Upper Limb Training into Routine Clinical Practice for Stroke Survivors and really looking at the perceptions of occupational therapists and physiotherapists who are the primary um, providers of upper limb rehabilitation uh, within the Australian setting. So as uh, Jose and Amy have both touched on, uh, um, upper limb robotics is um, emerging in Australia and just quoting similar percentages um, to or similar study, uh, our audit data as Amy did, Probably about 15 years ago, I wouldn't have thought there'd be, have been probably any or very, very few robotic devices in play in Australia in, in the rehabilitation setting. In the National Audit, Stroke Audit in 2014, there was about 9% of stroke survivors who had upper limb deficits were receiving robotics as part of their upper limb program. And then in the most recent audit in 2019, there was about 12% of stroke survivors who had upper limb deficits we're receiving robotics as part of their program. So it's slowly beginning to emerge. And um, as we can appreciate, most of the research in this space around uplink robotics for stroke survivors has been on the efficacy of these devices. And so it should be, but there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on the implementation process or implementation science and how best to um, put these devices into practice. And because, um, as again has been highlighted by the other two speakers this evening, it can be quite a complex process to implement technology like robotics into play. There's lots of organisational factors, financial factors, patient factors and clinician factors like we're focusing on tonight. And abandonment is a big problem. Exactly, Amy said that already tonight. So it matters that we get the implementation process right and we understand how implementation works in different countries and in different settings. And particularly with uplink robotics, it matters, particularly from the point of view, like we've just seen with Amy, that it can have a significant impact, particularly at an impairment level in improving uh, uplink recovery for stroke survivors. And secondly, these things don't aren't cheap, they cost money. And so we want to see that it, uh, taxpayers' money is used effectively or uh, or or the patient's money itself is used effectively as well. And, and we get this implementation process right. So the aim of what this little study was to explore OT and physiotherapist perspectives and acceptance of robotics about 20 months past the implementation of it into practice. So they'd had time to use it or not use it and integrate it into the practice. And this is part of a broader study where I also looked at the sustainability of this robotic device over a couple of years. Did it continue to get used or was it abandoned? Uh, I also looked, we also did some observations of sessions of for subacute stroke survivors prior to the robotics arriving and then post robotics arriving. So I'm going to reference some of those studies as well, because these all they all feed together to inform what does the implementation look like for this particular upper limb device. And it is one of the devices that uh, Jose mentioned. This is the InMotion 2. So it's a couple of years uh, old now, but it's probably the most uh, certainly the most researched upper limb robotic device on the planet. There's been about 900 um, participants in clinical trials um, since, since it's come into play. And it's, it's in clinical use around 250, there's 250 devices worldwide. So, um, so the setting for this device uh, is it was an Australian inpatient rehabilitation facility. And they, they have about 42 beds and about 600 emissions, emissions a year. And of, of those, there's about 100 stroke survivors that come through the doors. And I talked to the occupational therapists and the physiotherapists working in this facility about their experiences with using this device as part of practice for the first time. And this is also the first time the in motion has been implemented into Australia. And that's and so that was of particular interest as well. 
um, to look at something that's used so broadly uh, in, on, in a global sense and also uh, has been researched so thoroughly. What does that look like as it particularly comes into the Australian setting? And so I used the theoretical domain framework to shape the questions I asked, and I also used it to analyze the responses of the therapist and also got them to each of the therapists to complete a system usability scale. I'm just going to briefly talk about um, why I use these things or why they are helpful if you're doing this kind of implementation study. Firstly, the theoretical domain framework or the TDF, it's a validated framework that sort of helps us know what are the key variables that determine whether a therapist um, like Amy or like myself or like Jose, what, why we would use something or why we wouldn't use something in terms of a new intervention and, and um, in this case, a robotic device. And we know that it seems like our knowledge about it, our skills, whether we feel it's within our professional scope, whether we believe it's going to actually improve or whether we feel as, uh, you know, improve a client's upper limb or whether we feel it might be dangerous. All these variables, um, we, we know they shape whether a therapist decides to use something or doesn't use it or, or, by, or by what degree. So I thought about those things, shape the questions that way and analyze the transcripts that way. And I also got them to use a little simple little scale called system usability scale, which is just a 10 Likert scale questions, which sort of gives their perceptions of the usability of the device. And now that from those 10 questions, you can get an overall score where um, each sorry, each question is sort of ranked on zero to 10 and 50 means anything that's 50 or less out of 100 means it's not particularly acceptable to the therapist, 50 to seven, 70, it's marginal and over 70, it is an acceptable device and intervention to use as part, you know, as part of practice. And, they, and the, the question, the, the scale asks things like, I found the system unnecessarily complex, I'll rate it zero to 10, or I would imagine that most people would use to um, the system uh, we're allowed to use the system very quickly, zero to 10. So there's sort of the questions we, we ask as part of the system usability scale to sort of complement that qualitative information we were getting from the focus groups. Okay, so um, we out of those nine variables that are or domains that we talk about with the theoretical domain framework, there were nine key things that were really shaping what facilitated and what um, impacted or was a barrier to the use of this robotic device particularly. And this is just the hand component. I showed you without the hand component before, this is just the small hand module that uh, goes with the in-motion device here. Um, the physiotherapists were the predominant users and we saw that from the audit data. They prescribed the robotic device 80% of the time that it was it was used in practice. So their, their rating of its usability was, was significantly higher. They're 74 out of 100 compared to the occupational therapist who were 59 out of 100. And I'll talk to why there was a, uh, a difference between the usage between the two disciplines. I'll get, just draw out a few more salient quotes as well that came and from the focus groups. I think they're helpful and they might be a bit of a stimulus for our questions as well. But um, they mentioned it definitely provides a very high intensity and rep repetition count for patients, especially for those with densely affected upper limbs. There's very few patients that we've just used the robot. And I think we've already talked about that, that importance of a combination of interventions. Uh, they normally have a combination of evidence-based interventions. So the therapists saw that, they recognised that. They said, I would tend to identify it as an initial modality, again, Jose was talking about that. The timing of when these things come into play is really, really important. We need to evolve our knowledge in that. And they also said, I think the patients really enjoy the fact that they can operate it themselves. I've noticed that, that, you, that you know really, um, I've noticed there, you know really quite engaged. It's like they're driving their own therapy. And I think this is really important. And again, Jose made that point that patient perceptions are essential when we're looking at effective evidence-based practice when working um, with um, upper limb recovery post-stroke. So in terms of what do we conclude from just this little case study insight into um, clinicians' perceptions of robotics and practice, both disciplines were very much accepting of it as part of, uh, as part of practice. They both saw its benefit, um, but the physiotherapists were the predominant users and simply that was because the device was positioned down their end of the gym. And that's, even though it seems like a funny little anecdote to emphasize, but it's really important, particularly with implementation, that location matters. 
um, that it's accessible uh, and that it's easy to use, it's ready to use, um, it's visible. All those things really matter about implementation and usage and integration and practice. Location really matters. And in fact, now in the facility, the robotics is down the OT end of the gym. They've decided to swap it over to, to mix it up and it'd be interesting to maybe see perceptions now and look at usage levels amongst the disciplines. But the other primary facilitators, obviously it, it really increased. They saw that it increased the repetitions and intensity of practice they could provide. And our observation data showed that from once um, the number of repetitions that are able to be achieved by subacute stroke survivors, before and after the introduction of the robotics increased by about 200% and the intensity of practice increased by about 140% for subacute strokes of all this. We saw that once this was introduced as an adjunct to, to their other broader therapy program they're involved in. They particularly saw it really was beneficial for those with that severe upper limb impairment who weren't able to engage as easily or at all in independent uh, upper limb practice. They felt it was easy to use, yeah, that strong patient acceptance um, was, a, was, a, was a real facilitating factor for them. Patients wanted to use it, even though the, 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 um, the visuals of the emotion are quite rudimentary, they're quite basic. That didn't seem to matter. Patients were able to engage in it with quite easily. And I think it, particularly when you're taking to factor ones with underlying cognitive and perceptual deficits, a simplicity uh, in the diagram, uh, in, sorry, in the... Um, the images they're seeing and interacting with, I think is quite helpful at times. Not making it too busy or complex can, um, can be a bit of a deterrent. The other key factor I just want to emphasize, just as we're finishing, that this was clinician initiated, not just clinician led, but it was initiated. So there was a senior physiotherapist, they got the funding, they wanted a robot, they got it. It, it wasn't executive or, or from the bosses above. And, and so it was a real grassroots initiative. And even though um, the implementation was pretty ad hoc. They just did a bit of training amongst themselves. Um, and because we know that usually when something is implemented that in an ad hoc way, that abandonment is, is, is a strong possibility. But that wasn't the case here, particularly because it came from the, from, the, from the therapist that it's continued to be used and, and, um, and it's and, and being used a lot. So being clinician initiated and led is really uh, important for the implementation process. Final couple of points is that they saw it as a bridging intervention. So what we call probably a pre-functional intervention robotics. Um, so once ones had that sufficient active movement happening in their upper limb, then they'll quickly really transition into very much a task specific uh, functional focus. Um, but it really helped provide that bridge where ones are in that severe to moderate phase where they have minimal amounts of active movement um, it, it, it was a key intervention then, but once ones could start to really engage in kitchen tasks or dressing or whatever that was that particular functional, then that became the focus. They saw it as a bridging, and um, and it was also just part of a package of evidence-based interventions that offering with them. It wasn't a silver bullet. It wasn't the whole answer. It was just part of a package. And um, the final thing is the hand module was difficult to use, and it, we saw in the data only about a quarter of percent of sessions actually used. Um, the hand module, and, and that is a you know as you read read the literature, the hand is still a bit of a you know it's a bit of a a, a difficult thing for the robotics to train and to get that that dexterous nature of the hand, and that you know it's the most complex component, but the most essential component, and 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 that was seen. They just didn't feel that that part of that uh, part of the robot really was doing the job, and they didn't feel it was. Um, necessary all the time or only necessary in cert for certain patients. So hopefully that's given some uh, insight there for you into, um, um, yeah, what, yeah, some clinicians' perspectives on the use of robotics in practice. So I'll stop sharing and then we can answer some questions, hopefully. Yes, thank you, Nick, for sharing your current work on, you know, upper limb robotics, stroke survivors. This is really interesting to hear about the adoption rate and percentage of use of robotics in Australia it's not it's not really very high but I, I, I'm excited that it's growing because you know as Jose shared you know the robotics have been around for more than 30 years yeah yeah I think it's a good it's a good question why has it taken so long and Amy and I were just talking about it a little bit together before this and I don't think uh, uh, the UK is significantly different I think it's still 
creeping up in the UK by the sound of it too. And I think, I think particularly from an evidence point of view, the, the reservation has been there where there's evidence at an impairment level, but really, you know, the, the, the therapists in Australia, and I, and I think all over the world, I don't think it's unique, really want to see those activity and participation results as well. And I, and I think that that evidence is still emerging. So I think there's been a more of a measured um, potentially, you know, this is just my opinion, there's been a more measured approach to, and they want to see those results happening uh, or, you know, at an activity and participation level as well. That's maybe one thought, um, particularly because occupational therapists are in the mix and they're very much activity and participation focused uh, and, you um, and they want to see those results. But I think I don't think the physiotherapists are any different uh, on that front either. So, and then you can talk to that as well. All right. Thank you to our speakers for their sharing. Uh, thank you for the audience for being patient as well. We are now open for questions. A reminder for everyone, please type them in the Q&A box below and we will direct them to our speakers. And we actually have one question from the Q&A box. Maybe I'll direct this to Nick. All right. Um, what are some of the more significant benefits, financial or otherwise, uh, that can be used as leverage when trying to encourage investments in these devices within the clinical environments? Yep, that is a good question. You know, what are the pros? You know, and I think um, I've touched on them already. Um, I think it's that ability for robotics to be an adjunct to practice, to, to change and really increase that intensity of practice and repetition of practice, um, that's, that's clear. And, and like Amy touched upon, and, the, and is the case in Australian audits, we're, we're not getting that intensity of practice in, in, in routine clinical practice. It's not happening. And there's been heaps of systematic reviews that show that, and it continues to show that. But robotics do offer a means of overcoming those challenges as a clinician to increasing in repetitions and intensity of practice. That's its big take on. It's not the answer. It's an adjunct that provides an, an independent practice as well, where you don't need someone like me or like Amy or Jose to sit there beside them and do that. They're the key things. There is some, um, the, the, I won't, I would I'd be a bit loath to talk through the cost analysis, cost benefit analysis and feasibility. There's, there is a good systematic review out there. But there's not lots and lots of information on that. Um, there, is, there is some positives about the, when you look at it. But um, I'll just say one more thing. When you're looking at cost, you really need to think about not just individually, you know, you need to look at the whole service. Long how many term how, picture. Sorry, so yeah, you can do how many. Long term picture. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how many stroke survivors do I have coming through a year into a service? How many of them have you know severe to moderate upper limb impairment that suit that particular device I'm looking to purchase? Do those numbers at that level is really, really important. Sorry, Amy, you go. That's right. I was just agreeing that you have to look at the longer, longer term picture in, in kind of how people are with more intensity. But also I think in terms of cost effectiveness, it's also um, thinking about your service model and maybe changing or adapting that service model to to provide the intensity so working a slightly different way from conventional therapy which is what we're learning quite quickly with our center in, in the uk um and like nick was saying earlier there's often a level of repetition and intensity to almost into an, an impairment level to get someone kind of over this hump to then allow them to have that activity to then work on their activity and participation elements. But there is that initial kind of creep over to get over there before you can do that. And sometimes that's where the intensity comes in really key. All right, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Amy, for your answer. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So um, due to time constraints, I'll probably just ask and direct this question, last question to Jose. Um, so Jose, what would your word of advice say so you've been um, a clinician that's used robotics for, you know, so many years? What is your word of advice to clinicians in adopting upper limb robotics as part of their clinical practice? Well, I think education is very important to, um, to know how to use robotics and other advanced technologies into clinical practice. So, 
normally we don't have at the university this kind of education or we have it only from a theoretical point of view but we don't have the possibility to use the devices to use them uh, with patients with real patients right so um, there is a lack of education in most of the professionals and then when a clinic or a hospital buys a device and then there is a, a training for the device maybe it's half a day one day maybe two days training but that's all so it is supposed that you need to learn in one day or two days everything that you you need to learn about technology and that's maybe impossible so education is a very important part and then the clinic and the, or the hospital the facility that it's using devices they need to have a clear um, um, rehabilitation philosophy so in many places also there are quite open. I've been in some places where they had devices and some of the therapists, they were, you know, very keen to use the devices and they were happy to use them. And other uh, therapists, they said, okay, I don't believe in robotics. So I don't, I'm not using robotics in the same clinic. Okay. And it's not a question of believing or not. It's a question, it's a matter of science, right? And it's a matter of the clinic saying, look, this is the way we work. Like, for example, Amy was showing in, in Hobbs or here at European Neurosciences Center. So everyone who is coming here into our clinic to work, they know that there is a, um, a rehabilitation philosophy and we use uh, robotics and other technologies as part of our protocol to increase intensity, to promote recovery. So that's not a, um, an election for the therapist to, okay, I want to use it. I don't want, I prefer to do that or this. No, no, this has to be clear. So those are maybe the main two points to start using more into clinical practice robotics. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, and Nick and Amy, do you feel like there's anything further to add in your word of advice into adoption? I think, I think it's it's about educating the therapists, but also providing like a framework of education that people can build on to get their experience with the devices and having dedicated um, kind of leads or experts with a device because there are so many devices you can't potentially be the expert in all of those devices. But if you have one key, key clinician within the center that knows that device really well, maybe works with it really well, that's when you start to get the clinical reasoning, be able to modify, be able to combine, and then disseminate that teaching further down. Um, but also, yeah, like I said, it's about thinking about how your service works and trying to embed that from the start of incorporating technology within that. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that would be what I've encouraged clinicians in my sphere in Australia is to to just get started, just get on the train with technology. And, and if there is a lot of devices out there and you do need to do your research and your homework, but somewhere you just need to make a decision and get going because because this, the, you know, technology is not going backwards, it's going forwards, it's going to get better, it's going to get more, it's, we're going to see those outcomes of that activity and participation. There's going to be a great, you know, a greater refinement of it all. So just getting a part of that, the movement of rehabilitation technology, I think is, is also the message we need to get to clinicians. Thank you so much, Jose, Amy and Nick. I think the key word today we've learned is education. So we need to educate early and hopefully that Motors Academy can also support the initiative to sharing um, all the knowledge and also educating you know, clinicians and future clinicians as well. Thank you, Jose, Amy, and Nick for being here today, and obviously our audiences. Next week, we have another webinar lined up. The title is Lower Limb Robotic, Intelligent Solutions for Gate Training. And joining us will be our president of Motors Academy, Professor Robert Rayner, and also Professor Wee Seng Kui from Singapore, and Ekaterina Beresi, CEO of ExoAtlet Global. Please register your attendance online and for now, I would like to say goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you all online next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. It was really, really enjoyable and very interactive.
Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you, Jose and Amy. Nice to meet you. Amy. Bye. Thank you for having me. See you guys. See you, Peggy. Bye-bye.